also want to welcome you here on behalf of um, the Town Knight Center for Entrepreneurial Journalism and uh, the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism and the uh, gratitude that the Knight Foundation has made this possible. John Bracken called uh, some uh, longer ago than I want to admit, uh, saying, uh, do you guys want to hold an innovation award? You seem like the right place to do it. And we said, of course, uh, thank you, yes. And the other good news, when Sarah heard about this, she said, that, well, next year we're going to make this even a lot bigger. <laughs> so next year is going to be a big event. But we're glad that Alberto Marjuan is here, Michael Manus, Marie Gio, who uh, suffered with my uh, ill organization to get here. So thank you all very much. Uh, Leonard Tao from the Tao Foundation is upstairs. He'll be down any second. And Andre Scholler is here from Tao as well. Um, so uh, I'm grateful to those folks. And um, this is an award for innovation. The school believes heartily in innovation and a non never ending process of change and development and disruption. And so we are proud to uh, be the, the, uh, the house for this, this award and for the first one this year. Sorry to drag you out on a miserably cold night. Uh, the people from Miami are not complaining, but the one from California is complaining mightily. <laughs> so uh, I want to bring up uh, Michael Manus, who is going to give the first award for uh, uh, the Knight Award for Innovation, and then we'll go on from there. So Michael. So um, we're really excited about this award. It, it came out of, um, it, it actually has a really long history of moving around different universities. <laughs> so we're happy that it's here. And we're really excited in particular uh, to do it uh, to, for the first recipient. And this was a, a much discussed uh, a, award for the first one because one, we wanted to make sure that um, the principles of the award were really captured in the first, in the first one that we did it. And it really is about someone who's bringing innovation to the space, has done it, um, has pragmatic results that demonstrate that, who is a thought leader in it and also is trying to drive um, the next steps and where we're going in the space. And there is no one that I think encapsulates that better than our first award winner, Loavida, which is Sue Gardner. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I want to thank uh, the Knight Foundation for the honor and opportunity that this represents. I am honored and I am flattered and I am also a little bit nervous because I kind of feel like I'm supposed to pull out of my pocket like some innovation <laughs> roadmap, which by the way, I do not have. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to tell a little bit of my own story. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is happening um, on the internet and how I think that we can perhaps influence its development in the way that we want to see it go. And of course, there's a lot of assumptions in there. Who is we and what do we want? Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So my own story is a really simple one. I spent the first half of my career learning public service values. I was a journalist at a high quality news organization and I saw my job as helping to provide people with the information that would enable them to make better decisions about their lives. And I subscribed to the old school credo, the really, really old newspaper credo of comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Then the internet came along and it became really clear really quickly that the internet was going to enable us all to do our jobs better than we had been previously able to do them. And what it was going to let us do was um, not necessarily journalism the way we'd historically understood it, so pounding the pavement and interviewing people and publishing what they said, but it was going to enable us to do it at, at a kind of better meta level, getting information to people in new ways and in transformatively better ways. And so something like Wikipedia obviously was able to do that really early, really well, because it got the intermediaries, the gatekeepers out of the way and let real people share information with each other, which was something we hadn't been able to do before. And when we could do it, it was awesome. And so that has been awesome. And I have spent the second half of my working life learning the internet, what it's good at and what we can use it for. So the internet is still pretty young and we're still refining it every day. And so it's important to note that my vision, such as it is, is not the only vision. There are a lot of different visions. Some people, I think, primarily see the internet as a place to make a lot of money, and people are making a lot of money online. I think some people see it as a playground, a sort of maker's paradise where you can build things and try them out and see what happens to them. I think that some people see it as an instrument of social control or perhaps as a threat to the social order. 
Um, and then there are people like me who see it mainly as a communications tool. It's to help people connect and communicate with each other. And so this brings me to uh, when Jeff phoned me and told me I was getting this award, he said something to the effect of, you are, of course, a communist, and so I'm not sure you should get the award. <laughs> so this brings me to the part where I have to say for Jeff, because he's sitting right here, I'm not a communist. <laughs> and Michael was right when he described me as pragmatic, because I am super pragmatic, right? And I, I know that some of the stuff that I'm going to say here tonight risks sounding like I am anti-money or anti-capitalism. And I am really, really, really not. There are a lot of public service people who find money distasteful and don't like talking about business models, and I'm not one of those people. When I first joined the Wikimedia Foundation, the first thing I did was get our financial house in order. We were making $2 million a year when I joined. Today we're making $60 million a year. That's really important because money is freedom and money is independence. We want to do a good job and you have to have a solid, stable base of funding in order to pay the salaries of the people, some of whom are in this room, um, who do the work that make the site run, right? So that was really, really important. I'm really interested in generating money and I'm also interested in generating it in the right way, right? You need a business model that supports the work that you're trying to do. I'm interested in that, not just for Wikipedia, but for the whole of the space. And so that's the thing that I'm gonna talk about here. So I spent the latter half of my career learning the internet. I did a lot of that at Wikipedia. I've been there for six years. When I started, there were eight of us in St. Petersburg in Florida. And today there are about 200 of us and we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so what that means is we're at the heart, really, of the technology revolution. I am the person whining at coming from California. It's very warm there. <laughs> um, it's where the hackathons happen. It's where there are a lot of meetups. It's really where this, there is the spirit of technological innovation that permeates the whole of the Bay Area. And so as a journalist and as a curious person, I have felt and I've been extraordinarily privileged to be at the heart of that and to see that it's history in the making, right? And I'm a part of it, I'm there. Glenn Greenwald um, is in the January edition of Esquire talking about his vision for what the internet is. And what he says is, the promise of the internet has always been that it was gonna be this unprecedentedly potent instrument of liberation and democratization. It was gonna let you explore things and meet people who you otherwise wouldn't get to know in ways that are completely free and completely unconstrained. That's what I believe in. And that's what I feel like I'm part of at the Wikimedia Foundation. I feel like I live at a kind of an unusual intersection of um, old school public service values <coughs> the first half of my career and where they intersect with this newer world where disruptive changes in communications technology are happening that are completely transformative for the world. I think the internet is important. I am unhappy about where the internet is headed. And so I feel like the purpose of my talk today is in part to define the problem as I see it, and then in part to point towards where I think there may be solutions. So first, the problem. Who here has read uh, Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch? Everybody needs to read Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch. I recommend, thank you. Yes, there it is. <laughs> well done. That's a Wikipedian. <laughs> um, it, really is, it really is an incredible story. It is the story of disruptive, internet, disruptive communications technologies and what happens when something new gets invented. And so it talks you through the story of radio, the story of television, the story of movies, I think the telephone. And what Tim says is that Every time something brand new is invented that breaks everything that came before it, we always have the same reaction. We always think the same thing, right? What we believe is going to happen is that it will usher in a garden of Eden of democratization, of access to information, and of education. We believe the whole world is going to be transformed. Because I worked at the CBC for a long time and because I am a good and earnest um, student, I used to go to the CBC Museum and look at the early schedules for radio and television for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And so I know that what Tim Wu said is correct, right? If you look at those early schedules, what you see is you see folks teaching each other Latin. You see people playing chess. You see them running classes on stamp collecting and how to identify different kinds of stamps. You see them teaching each other calculus and geography and political science and history. So that's where we started with those communications technologies. 
But if you fast forward a half a century, obviously that's not where things have ended up, right? The whole thing has collapsed. Both radio and television today, some company accepted, are mostly terrible, and there isn't a lot of public service value being represented there. <clears throat> I see the same thing happening online today. So what are we seeing online? The first thing is we're seeing an awful lot of consolidation, right? Today, the vast majority of people's time online is spent on sites that are run by mega corporations, by Facebook, by Google, by Yahoo, et cetera. The list of the most popular websites in the world used to be really volatile. People used to come and go all the time from it, and now it's much more stable. It's rare for a new site to enter, for example, the top 10. The last one probably was Facebook about five years ago. The powerful sites, the big important sites, with Wikipedia accepted. They have an awful lot of money and they use it to protect their interests. And so what we've seen the last couple of years is big internet companies hiring up a lot of lawyers, hiring up a lot of lobbyists to buy influence for themselves in DC. And we've also seen them starting to snap up their competitors, right? They want to prevent further disruptive innovation from disrupting them. When I say that, I know that it risks sounding a bit conspiratorial. It sounds like a conspiracy theory, but it's really not. I mean, it's obviously, that's just self-interested corporations. That's what they're built to do. That's what they're designed to do. It's what they're supposed to do. And so that's what they're doing. What it means, though, is that the playing field is getting less level. It's getting a lot harder to make new stuff than it used to be. When Jimmy made Wikipedia about 12 years ago, he did it from his spare bedroom at, in his apartment in Clearwater in Florida, and it had a shot at becoming something that was important. But today, it's a lot harder for a new project to break through. And if it does break through, increasingly, it's just gonna be bought up by somebody else. So that's a tough situation. And it's made worse by two factors that I think are kind of additionally important. The first one is, there is so much money sloshing around in the Bay Area that the price of engineering talent has gone through the roof, right? So there's been a talent war to hire engineers in the Silicon Valley area for years, maybe for 10 years now, and the prices keep going up, and that's bad for people who want to do public service work. And the other thing is that public service people are and have always been kind of notoriously bad at figuring out the business model stuff, right? And what that means is that we aren't shaping the business models. And so the business models on the internet are increasingly being defined and they're being solidified and it's happening by the pivot model of venture capitalism or through the pivot model of venture capitalism. And so what that means is you build something, it's lovely, it's beautiful, so it attracts a lot of users. And then you pivot, once people start using it, you pivot away from the original idea towards whatever is gonna bring in your revenue. That's the model that's defining what's happening on the internet today. So I told you earlier that I care a lot about the money side, and I told you that the flavor of journalism that I subscribe to is the muckrakey kind, right? The afflicting the comfortable, the comforting the afflicted. And so what I think is that we need more sites and apps and services and products that do, I think, three things. And these are intended to be, and I think they are, subversive. So the first is they want to be built for the benefit of ordinary people. That's basic public service, right? We want to help people. The second thing is that they want to be built incorporating the participation of those ordinary people. That's the new thing that we can do now because of the internet that we could not do before. And then the third thing that I think is really important is that they want to be funded by the people who use them. They want to be funded by ordinary people just like Wikipedia is. And so I want to talk about that funding component. So when I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, thank you. <laughs> when I joined the Wikimedia Foundation, we got our money from a mix of sources. So we got some of it from ordinary people, not very much. We got some of it from super wealthy um, Silicon Valley people, that was great. And we also got some money from a mix of business development, um, what's called in nonprofit land, earned income. So we sold live feeds and we had uh, trademark licensing deals. And I would say that probably my signal achievement at the Wikimedia Foundation, the thing that I am most proud of, is that I streamlined and I sharpened up our revenue model. And so today, 95% of the money that we bring into the Wikimedia Foundation that funds Wikipedia comes from ordinary people. 
Um, we're a nonprofit. People donate online because they want to. They give us $10, $20, $100. That's how we make our money. I really, really like that model. That model makes a lot of sense. I like it because it gives us freedom and independence, and it also keeps us honest. I think you want to have a model where your revenue rises and falls with your performance, because otherwise it's too hard to tell if you're doing a good job. And so if you've got like a really fantastic fundraising team, but you're not providing very good value for your users, that's not really good. If you're providing fantastic value, but you're not very good at the money part, that's not good either. I think you want them to rise and fall together. I like our model too, because I think it orients us towards the right people. I want the Wikimedia Foundation, I want Wikipedia paying attention to ordinary people who it's supposed to be serving, right? You pay attention to the people who pay the bills, and so I want us looking to those people. Where your money comes from, that's who you listen to. <clears throat> I think there's an opportunity. If you do it right, it works really well, and there's a risk if you do it wrong. And so I want to talk about what wrong looks like. <coughs> if your business model doesn't allow for users to pay their own costs, then you're going to have to find somebody else to pay. A couple of years ago, there's a guy on Metafilter who said famously, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. And I think that's true. In a reasonable case scenario, that might look something like the ordinary quid pro quo of advertising, but it might also mean blurring the line between marketing and editorial, something that journalists have a lot of unhappy experience with, and it might also mean the selling of users' private data. And those are crappy models, right? Those aren't models that help. So I know that there are people who think that the Wikipedia model doesn't work for everybody, because in order for it to work, you're going to need to have a really big audience, and I think that's a legitimate worry. I think it used to be more true. I think today it's less true um, now. And some of that is just the ordinary mechanics, right? There used to be only a very small number of people who would do things like payment processing, so there was only PayPal. Now there are multiple payment processors. They're also getting better at taking money in from around the world. They're taking in more currencies. I think that everywhere in the world, regulations are gradually starting to relax, making it easier to shift money around to other countries than it used to be. The fees of the payment processors are dropping. Sites like Wikipedia, we do a ton of A-B testing and we share what we learn so other people can learn from what we have done. All of that is getting easier. But more, I think, what's actually happening is that people are changing. I think our habits and our behaviors are changing. I think that we are <coughs> gradually shifting as a society from a focus on the physical world into a focus on the mental world and the world of our imaginations. Even home ownership is dropping, right? We are owning fewer things. We are renting more. We are using things when we need them and not owning them when we don't need them. We travel more. We relocate more often. We know more people in more different countries. Distance is collapsing. I think that helps us feel empathy for each other in ways that we weren't able to do before. And I think increasingly people are willing to pay for intangibles such as knowledge, such as information. I think people will pay for the pleasure of supporting the little guy, for the jolt of satisfaction that comes from thinking you've done something good in the world. We get that jolt of satisfaction by doing something like contributing to Wikipedia as an editor, and we get it equally by supporting Wikipedia as a donor. And I think that's why we're seeing people give money to sites like Wikipedia, but not just Wikipedia, also um, Kickstarter, Donors Choose, Kiva, all kinds of things. These aren't self-interested transactions. They aren't made after a careful evaluation of what's in it for me, and they don't really resemble traditional charity. I don't think you have to be a nonprofit, and there are lots of organizations that are not nonprofits that are using this model. There are people funding stuff because they think it's great, because they love it, and because they want to see more of it. I think that's awesome, and I think it has a really great future. So if you take one thing away from my talk, I would like it to be this. If you're building something, I sometimes feel like my, my time at the Wikimedia Foundation has been like one massive trust fall, right? Like I've just trusted, <laughs> and it's worked out really well. Um, and I think if you're building something, you should consider a trust fall like that. You could do a rigid paywall, you could do advertising, you could do any number of conventional fundraising techniques, but I think you should consider just asking your users for help. Because I think that, as Clay Shirky said, I think a variant on this, if, if they value what you're doing, if they think you're doing a good job, 
they will find a way to pay you to let you continue doing it. 